Watch out for the crypto projects that build in the bear because they will crush it in the bull. And I got to tell you, there is no better time than right now because I know some people will say that this is a this is just a very prolonged uh, bull market. It doesn't feel like a bull market. And I got to tell you, some of the things that are going on behind the scenes uh, makes me uh, quite bullish, even though the sentiment itself is not too great. And I'm going to talk about three different projects, of course. Uh, we're going to talk about Solana, which I know some of you uh, absolutely despise, but uh, it is what it is. Talk about Ethereum and then everybody's favorite, get into Bitcoin. So the first piece, I think people have been talking about it lately, uh, especially on YouTube and the Twitterverse and all those different places. But uh, I am right now in South Korea, so uh, my time frame is a little bit messed up. But uh, this is what I've learned and how things are, are progressing. This is from Business Wire. It looks like Visa is expanding stablecoin settlement capabilities to merchant acquirers. And on top of that, it's going to be using Solana. So this is what we have. Visa is expanding its stablecoin settlement capabilities to the high-performing Solana blockchain and is working with merchant acquirers, WorldPay, and Nuvi. Visa has already moved millions of USDC between its partners over the Solana and Ethereum blockchain networks to settle fiat-denominated payments authorized over VisaNet. And on this would be, to, to me, this was a big story anyhow, but it really hit home today as I was uh, taking different taxi cabs and paying for things here in South Korea. Fantastic food, fantastic people. And one of the things about that you have to understand about payments, and somebody I never really considered, there's when you actually purchase a, when you actually purchase a product or a service or a good or whatever else, and settlement. When I purchase something, let's just take a taxi cab driver. When I purchase something, it's instantaneous, right? I give them my card, they run it through, boom, everybody's paid from what we think it is. But there's actually another layer to that. That's the settlement. And settlement is expensive and it takes a lot of time for the money from my account in my bank, USAA, to go over to the merchant's account who will be here. That's going to take a lot of uh, work and effort and cost. So to actually reduce that would actually be a great thing. And what Visa is doing, which is a uh, you know, lion's share of what uh, people are using for, for payment processors, is they're going to use uh, crypto behind the scenes. And one of the ones that they picked on top of USDC, the stablecoin, and of course in the Ethereum network, is Solana. And what this says to me is, I know people, like I said, they hate Solana because, ah, uh, bro, it's a it's a totally uh, centralized network, and it always goes down all the time, and just awful. Well, Visa must have done its uh, homework because they picked it. So I know people may say that they, you know, they hate it and whatnot, and it's just awful. But you have to look behind the scenes and go, which ones are winning in the background? Which ones are building? And I don't really care. I'm agnostic. I'm not here to change the world. I'm here to change my bank account. And if Solana is going to be the one, one of the ones that are there, so much the better. Now, does this, does this mean that Solana is going to take over the world? No, but it's a step in the right direction. You just have to pay attention to what's going on, I think. So this was actually from a quote from Kai Sheffield, nailed it, head of crypto of Visa. He says, by leveraging stable coins like USDC and global blockchain networks like Solana and Ethereum, we're helping to improve the speed of cross-border settlement and providing a modern option for our clients to easily send or receive funds from Visa's treasury. Visa is committed to being on the forefront of digital currency and blockchain innovation and leveraging these new techs to help improve the way we move money. Now, does this mean that this is the only thing moving forward? No, this is just one of the different, of the many options that are out there. I know people are going to ask me, well, wow, cross-border payments, that's something some XRP should do. Look, XRP can't do it all if that's what you're into. So with these companies moving forward with different places and different projects like Solana, I think it's something to sit up and pay attention to and say, you know what, if it can produce this settlement, if it can actually have the, the TPS that is high, and if it can stay up and it uh, begins to actually, you know, pick up these partners, this might be something to take a really harder look at as far as investing. And again, uh, I don't care if, uh, if, you, if you hate them or not, it's, it's up to you to uh, take a look at this information. And to me, I think it's a step and where things should go. And on top of that, Solana, I just, this is uh, from CoinShares, year-to-date inflows suggest it's the most loved altcoin. Now, let's be honest. A lot of altcoins, including Solana, are down massive. So it's not like this is, uh, you know, is going to turn things around. I think Solana is down over 93%, 94% for the year. And we took a look yesterday 
at uh, some of the biggest bag holders. And uh, unfortunately, Solana is way down from its high of $212. Does that mean it can't uh, rally? Just take a look. So Solana, and this is from uh, CoinShares report, trading volumes for crypto investment products, just products in general, for the week ending September 1st were 90% above the year-to-date average. It marks a seven-week run of negative sent- sentiment that's seen 342 million leave crypto products over that time. But year to date, investment products remain net inflow positive at 165 million. And we want to take a look at which ones are net positive. Outflows haven't affected Solana products. However, we saw weekly inflows of $700,000. I guess that's somewhat positive direction. Ninth straight week in a row with inflows of of 14.1 million over that time and white year to date inflows of $26 million. Bitcoin products were the only other assets to see weekly inflows besides Solana, totaling 3.8 million. Short Bitcoin, Polygon, and ETH products all recorded weekly outflows. So why is it such a big thing? Again, there are narratives out there. It's not just all about TA. There's actually you know, some narratives and some positivity of people that are building. September 1st, MakerDAO co-founder Rune Christensen submitted a proposal to build the project's upcoming native chain off a fork of Solana's code base, despite its uh, long-held relationship and ties to Ethereum. August 23rd, it was reported that uh, Shopify added Solana-based payment network Solana Pay, starting with the stablecoin USD coin. Solana Network has also seen some performance and reliability improvements with only one outage in 2023 so far. It's pretty good. Again, People will say, but it's, it's outages all the time. I think that's the narrative that we've seen before. Now we'll see if it can keep up as people use it more and more and more. But uh, so far in 2023, it has only been down one, one time. And I like this last sentence. Take this with a grain of skull. Solana's price is up around 95.5% year to date. 95, almost 100%. Solana's price is up almost 95% but it's traded mostly sideways around $20 to $25 since mid-January. However, Solana is down 92% from its 2021 all-time high of nearly, wow, I was wrong, 260 bucks. So right now you're looking at a price of around uh, $15, $20, somewhere around there for Solana. Just remember that from its all-time high to where it's at right now, it's a pretty undervalued asset. Does that mean that you should uh, fumble into it? No, but I will just tell you this. Solana is one of those projects that I dollar cost average every day. Now, does that mean that uh, it's going to be the end all be all? No, but again, I think it's something to take a look at. So let me know what you think about that in the comment section. I'm sure it'll be uh, spicy for what you say. And on top of that, I think this is more good news. Just optionality. MetaMask is going to have a sell feature, which you're going to be able to turn Ethereum and Ethereum based products and L2s in the cash right within MetaMask. Here's what we got. So MetaMask wallet owners can now cash out of their ether with the press of a button, converting their holdings into, into straight cash, fiat currency. For now, it's only US dollars, euros, and the British pound are supported, which is pretty good, and you got three different fiats. Initially, only ether or Ethereum mainnet could be cashed out, but MetaMask does have plans to expand the other layer two networks and assets. Layer twos, maybe an Arbitrum, maybe a Polygon, all that's a side chain. So we'll see. MetaMask didn't elaborate on which layer twos and tokens it plans to support or what timetable, but it is in the network. There are four known crypto fiat off ramps that MetaMask is working with, including MoonPay, eh, Transax, Sardine, and Banksa. These are the ones that can allow that for you to turn your crypto into cash if you so choose so. I don't know why you do that, but uh, everybody's got their own thing. Each of these services will offer real-time quotes to users who like to, who would like to sell Ether. Once the user selects the providers, they'll be redirected to a website, and they'll have to link to their bank account. So again, if you're into that, that's not my thing, but if you're like, hey, I want to link my bank account to my Ethereum wallet or uh, MetaMask, <laughs> go right ahead. And it looks like that's going to be uh, optionality for people moving forward. So that takes care of the Solana. That takes care of the Ethereum news. Let's go to everybody's favorite. Bitcoin. And there's good news in the horizon. 
It looks like the SEC, this is from uh, Grayscale. They have no grounds to reject the Bitcoin ETF conversion. This is just a quick little snippet story that uh, Grayscale's legal team wrote in a letter to uh, the SEC uh, yesterday. And it states, after the commission has had the opportunity to fully analyze the court's opinion in light of the record, including the reasons for rejection set forth, we believe the commission should conclude that there are no grounds for treating the trust differently from ETPs that invest in Bitcoin futures contracts. And again, this was a decision going in Grayscale's favor, which I thought was pretty uh, enormous, that they said, look, there's no difference between a futures ETF and a spot ETF. So you should allow us to do that. And, and what people are saying is that because the court has, has decided in that way that the SEC will only move towards a Bitcoin ETF and it, it, it is inevitable, I personally think it just gives uh, the SEC a little bit more time to give a reason as to another point of why they'll reject this Bitcoin ETF, but I could be wrong. And uh, we'll see how it all works out. And uh, it's not just random people that think this, this ETF is going to go through. Actually, everybody's favorite SEC commissioner, or former SEC commissioner, Jay Clayton, was actually on record saying that uh, the ETF approval is inevitable. I don't know why that uh, he couldn't do it beforehand, but uh, here's Jay saying that it's going to actually happen. This is a quote from CNBC, and he states, it's clear that Bitcoin's not a security. I think even Gary Gensler has said that. It's clear that Bitcoin is something that retail investors want access to, institutional investors want access to, and importantly, some uh, trusted providers who are fiduciaries or have duties of best interest want to provide this product to the retail public. So I think the Bitcoin ETF is inevitable. The thing is with Jay, and he knows it's very true. What the SEC is saying is that the problem with the spot ETF is the ability for manipulation. And that's why they want monitoring. And that's why BlackRock came out and all the different ones, Bitwise, ARC, Fidelity, came out and said, okay, we're going to choose Coinbase to use as to, actually, to absolutely cover this for monitoring, which will reduce manipulation. However, it doesn't make much sense to me of why they're going to approve a futures ETF, why they can't approve a spot ETF, other than the fact that Gary Gensler doesn't want to do it. And the White House, who he works for, is also saying the same thing. So I'm in the minority. I don't think it's going to be approved, but uh, we'll see. Everybody's against me, even Jay Clayton. <laughs> so we'll see how it works. Hopefully it does. But it does to me, again, it doesn't really matter because I think the narrative is there. we got some pretty big players who, who say it. And I will say that I think and this is uh, from looking to Bitcoin. Uh, there's a link in the description. It's 100% free. I mean, there's some upgrades if you want to use it now, but uh, there's this thing called the, the rainbow chart, the rainbow price chart indicator. And this is just a logarithmic uh, growth curve. And it just kind of takes a look at sentiment across, across the board. So when things are, it's, it makes things very simple of where you think that uh, potentially you could sell or where you should buy. And I just was perusing the different uh, charts and it, it's, it's pretty good. It shows you like when things are way massively overheated. 2011, it did a great job in 2011, 2013, and 17, it nails it perfectly, but it could be looking retroactively. Didn't do such a good job in 2021 when we had that double top, but I will tell you what it really is good at is for when things are bottoming and a good time to accumulate over time. Now, I can't tell you what to do. I'm not a financial advisor, but you can just see that when it's cold and cooling off, this is in 2015. It was, uh, you know, you had a high in, of uh, in 2013 of, gosh, almost over a thousand dollars, and it dropped over 80 percent. Now you're like 229, 218. Great time to accumulate. And then 2017 overheated, and then figured out that hey, a great time to accumulate was uh, around March 18th, March March 2020, when that thing called coronavirus came about, and Bitcoin was only uh, 5,000, 4,800. And now again, let me zoom in. There's been very few times when it's gone below the blue level. And that just happened in December and November when the Bitcoin price was 16510 Now, does that mean it can't go lower? No, but I think we're pretty darn close to what it is. And uh, unless it drops off the cliff, and uh, we talked about this in a um, video a couple of days ago, we took a look at uh, the macro factors 
the difference uh, with the SEC, what could potentially happen with the ETF. But, I mean, if we're looking at uh, the bottoms, maybe the bottom is in. I still think it can go lower, but, I mean, if we're taking a look at uh, different charts, uh, we can see that uh, things are pretty cool off. Does that mean it couldn't drop below 16 again? No, could happen again. But this is why I dollar cost average. I think that Q4 could be pretty bad if we go into recession. But things are looking, I mean, reasonable for dollar cost averagers uh, like myself. But there is some things that concern me. And lastly, Coinbase. I, I don't know why they're doing this. Other than it's a nice way to make money. Coinbase creates a new crypto lending service geared towards large investors. You know who also did lending services? Uh, BlockFi and Celsius. So this just is, uh, it's concerning to me because I thought Coinbase was going in the right direction and uh, just doing different services like Coinbase One where you could sign up and uh, reduce the amount of uh, fees that you have for a, for a monthly fee. Works great. Now they're getting into lending. I just think it's too much, but here's what we got. So Coinbase created a new crypto lending service in the U.S. for institutional clients, helping to fill the void <laughs> left by blowups of firms like Genesis and BlockFi. Didn't work out too great for them. The platform was quietly revealed in a U.S. and the SEC commission filing on September 1st, which showed $57 million had already been raised for the program. Again, money's a powerful drug. And when you have that much and people want to buy it, you're like, sure, come on in. So clients can lend Coinbase money, predominantly crypto assets, and get collateral exceeding the value of the loan. That's exactly what Celsius did. Celsius, I still believe, was a Ponzi scheme, but whatever. Such over-collateralization acts as a safeguard from disaster. Same thing that happened with Celsius. BlackFi, I think that was also the same thing. Point, Coinbase can then turn around and make secured loans to institutional trading clients, akin to the prime brokerage services banks provide in traditional finance. And of course, this was an issue also with Three Arrows Capital. So maybe we learned our lesson. And it's not going to go back the same way, but who am I to say? New service differs from the controversial Lend program that Coin Coinbase canceled in 2021. That was pitched at retail customers. SEC didn't like that. Of course, and of course, there wasn't enough disclosures and Gary wanted to protect everybody harder. So that's what we have. Good luck to Coinbase. I think that's a mistake, but uh, what do I know? And that's it for today. So look, everybody, thanks for stopping by. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. I think talk about is time sensitive. And uh, now if you're so akin to stick around, I'll answer all your questions to the best of my abilities and we'll go from there. But that's it. If you got to take off, thanks for stopping by. See you guys in the next one.